This sermon is brought to you by Christ Church South Philadelphia, a church that is committed to living out the gospel in their neighborhood and from there impacting the world. For more information about our church or to support our mission, you can go to www.christchurchsouthphilly.org. And so we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 today. 1 Peter chapter 5 as you make your way there. We are finishing up our time in this letter. Uh, we have been in this letter since May, and so we've been going through this series for, for quite a bit of time. It, it, it's been written to us uh, by Peter. Peter is one of the followers of Jesus. Uh, he was known as an apostle, and so he was one of the people who laid the foundation for the church that Jesus used to spread the good news of himself around the world through which his church could be built. And Peter wrote this letter to a group of local churches that he had helped start. And this morning, we are going to be reading verses, five, uh, verses 6 through 14. 6 through 14. If you're wondering why we're skipping over verses 1 through 5, uh, that's because, if you remember, several months ago, we uh, had the privilege of ordaining Caleb McCurley as another pastor in our church. And so we have three pastors now in our church, so grateful for each one of them, Pastor Matt, and now also Pastor Caleb. And I, I went out of order in our series because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, he talks about pastors. And so it's like, well, it probably makes sense to preach on pastors the day that we're ordaining a pastor. And so I preached out of order, and so I'm not going to go back. I don't really have anything new to say in the next, like, three months. So uh, we're just going to jump in to verse 6 through 14. And what really what we've seen throughout this letter, if we could kind of summarize Peter's point, he's been trying to help us understand how we are exiles here on earth. We're exiles here on earth. If you, fo- if you are a follower of Jesus, what that means is you are not from here because Jesus is not from here. And so if you're following him, that means that you're also not from here. And so we, we're only passing through this life. Yet, as we've seen, even though we're passing through this life, we're not meant to pass by this life. There are things that God wants us to do right here and right now. And yet, as we live in this sin-cursed world, we've seen that following Jesus, our spirituality, is often lived in a context of adversity. That There are things in this world that want to draw us away from God, that want to disrupt our trip home, if you will. And so as we navigate life in this world, we have seen again and again how we need to be ready and equipped to stand firm in our faith. And this morning, as Peter kind of wraps up this letter, he has one final message to us about how to stand firm in our faith. Peter's going to talk to us about the internal struggle we can face of anxiety. He's then going to talk to us about the external enemy we can face of our adversary. And finally, he's going to direct us to the assurance that God gives us for those things. And so I've been telling this morning's sermon, our anxieties, our adversary, and God's assurance. Let's turn our attention to the reading of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 6. God says to us through his servant Peter, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by our brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvius, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all who are in Christ. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray God's prayer blessing upon the preaching of his word? God, thank you 
that the same spirit which inspired Peter to write these words in such a way that they are your words to us. Your same Holy Spirit is now here with us to illuminate to our hearts the words that you have inspired. And so God, we pray you would do that. I pray you would open the eyes of our hearts that we might see the truth that you have for us today in your word. God, I ask for your help upon myself that my words would be used to elevate your words, that we might hear you speaking to us. By the power of your Spirit, I pray that a far greater sermon would be heard than the one that I'm actually even going to preach. Would you be good to us? And what we have not, would you give? What we know not, would you teach? What we are not, would you make us? Would we leave here, not with fuller heads, but with fuller hearts in Christ? We praise the name of Jesus. Amen. So for our time together in our text this morning, I want us to see how we are to deal with our anxieties. We're going to talk about dealing with our anxieties, defending against our adversary, and then depending on God's assurance. Dealing with our anxieties, defending against our adversary, uh, depending upon God's assurance. So first, dealing with our anxieties. According to the World Health Organization, levels of anxiety saw their biggest jump ever recorded from the year 2020 to the year 2021. I want, did something happen that year? Like what, I wonder what, what could have possibly, obviously COVID disrupted things a little bit. It, it dramatically impacted life as we know it and showed how little control we have over pretty much anything. And the natural human response to life being out of control is to feel anxiety. Webster's Dictionary defines anxiety as a feeling of unease about an uncertain outcome. That's what anxiety is. It's a feeling of unease about an uncertain outcome. Anxiety is the worry and stress we can feel when there's a gap between what we think should happen and our ability to actually make it happen. Anxiety is the emotion we feel when we realize we're not in control. And what we're seeing here in 1 Peter is that anxiety is not a modern phenomenon. (laughs) Peter's telling these people to cast their anxieties on God, which means what? In order to cast something, you have to know that you have it in the first place. And so the context here is Peter's writing to people who are anxious. And as we've seen throughout this letter, Peter's writing to people who are in the midst right now at this very moment as he's writing this letter to them. They're watching their friends, their families, their spouses being dragged into prison for their faith in Jesus because it was illegal in the Roman Empire during this time to be a Christian. And their imprisonment often led to them being slaughtered in the gladiatorial games. And you combine that with the daily just stress of living in an ancient world where you're always at risk of danger and disease and hunger and death. And I'm sure that these people's mental health situation was not that great. Anxiety is a common human experience. As we often find ourselves in uncertain situations over which we have little to no control. Now, while anxiety is a common human experience, God does not want it to be his children's consistent experience. And so he speaks to us about how to deal with our anxiety. And he tells us in verse 6 that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We deal with anxiety through humility. We deal with anxiety through humility. What is humility? Humility is realizing That there is something in the world that is greater than yourself and being in all of it. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. I'm so terrible. I'm such a bad person. No, it's it's being aware there's someone greater than yourself. I love what Pastor Tim Keller writes in his wonderful book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It is being blissfully unaware of you. And completely aware of God. And humility is the antidote for anxiety. Because when we feel like something is out of our control, humility is recognizing that there is someone greater than us who is always in control. And so in our anxieties, there there, there might be some neurochemical things going on. There might be some neuropathways that have been created from previous trauma. The Bible teaches that we are psychosemantic beings. We're beings who have a, a spiritual side and a physical side at the same time. And our Brains are part of our bodies. 
And so it is unbiblical to think that there could not be physical issues at play when we're dealing with anxiety. You might need some medication. You might need some therapy. Praise God for those common graces. But while there can be physical issues at play, there's also a spiritual side to this as well. Because if humility is the antidote for anxiety, what's the opposite of humility that then fuels our anxiety? So my brothers want to say here, pride. 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 We don't feel in control, and because we don't feel in control, well, who else could possibly be in control? There's no one else other than us, and so we worry. Commentator Tom Schreiner, in his excellent commentary in 1 Peter, he writes this about this verse. I think it's helpful. Worry is a form of pride, because when believers are filled with anxiety, they're convinced that they must solve all the problems in their lives and in their own strength. And the only God they are trusting in is themselves. That's what's happening. We feel anxiety, like, okay, I'm the only solution to all these problems. And because we feel inadequate, we feel anxious. But who are we trusting in those moments? We're trusting ourselves. Now, we're saying that we can't do it. But because we think we can't do it, we think it can't be done. And so, spiritually, anxiety is a form of pride. Like, great, now not only do I feel stressed, but I feel guilty about having stressed. I'm stressed about being stressed. Thanks for coming to, you know, glad I came to church today. The point here is not to make you feel guilty. The point is that we can see what we actually need. When we're experiencing anxiety, we need to understand, it's not, it's not that we need a different set of circumstances. There, there might be nothing in our life that actually needs to change. What might need to change is us. We might need to change. The path to peace comes through not getting these things under control and working really hard to make sure every variable in life is perfectly going the way that we think it should. No, the path to peace does not come from us being in control or or, or through us even trying really hard, okay, I'm not going to worry, I'm not going to worry, I'm not going to worry, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to be strong. Yeah, let me know how that goes. No, what we need to realize is when I'm feeling anxious, that's like a fuel light coming on in my car. My anxiety is telling me something about myself. It's telling me that I'm running a little bit low on humility. I'm running a little bit low on awe of God. Peter says we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. As he says the mighty hand of God, he is conjuring up for us. Not just, hey, realize God's great. No, he's saying realize exactly what is great about God. The the mighty hand of God is a short phrase to begin to expound and think about the great works that God has accomplished. When the Bible uses the word God's mighty hand, God's mighty hand gets used throughout Scripture to speak about the great things that God does. And so this is what Peter is saying. When we're feeling anxiety and we're obsessing about what we're concerned about, we need to start obsessing and thinking about something else. It's not that we say, okay, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to start thinking about God and the great works of who he is. I'm going to start thinking about what his mighty hand does. And so Isaiah chapter 48 tells us that God's mighty hand is what laid the earth's foundations. Psalm 139 says, God's mighty hand is what knits us together in the mother's womb and forms us. He makes everything, and he makes very, very intricate things. God's God's mighty hand is the hand that delivered the Israelites when they were enslaved to Egypt with no way out, nowhere to go. It says they were brought out of their slavery by the mighty hand of God. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah talks about how God's arm of salvation is revealed. In the New Testament, the books written after Jesus came, we see it's God's hand that's said to do miracles. It's God's hand that's said to do bring life. It's God's hand that is said to have raised Jesus from the dead. When Peter's speaking about the mighty hand of God, he is speaking about God's creating, delivering, healing, resurrecting power. And humbling ourselves is about recognizing that we're not in control, but there's nothing that's outside of his hands. And we gain humility by meditating on God and the greatness of his might. This passage is directing us to God's power. And it's directing us to God's love. I think one of the most precious verses to me when I'm struggling with my worries is verse 7. It says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 
God help us believe that. Friends, this is telling us that this all-powerful God is the God who cares for you. And Peter is writing this as someone who saw firsthand the care of God displayed on that hill called Calvary. He, he was there. We're hanging on that hill. Jesus took the judgment of God that you and I deserve for our sins against God. In our most honest moments, uh, we know that we don't just make mistakes. We know that we can do things that are wrong. And it would be an unjust universe if wrongs went unpunished. God is too much of a God to not be a God of justice. And so he will not, indeed he cannot, turn a blind eye to the wrong things we do. Sin must be dealt with. But because he cares for us, in his divine wisdom, he has made a way to be merciful to us and yet at the same time still just towards sin. And he did this through Jesus coming. And since Jesus came as a man, he was able to suffer for the sins of humanity. But as he also came as God, it was God who was taking that suffering upon himself. And so part of what we need to do when we're feeling anxious is not only think about the power of God, we need to think about the care of God. Oh, friends, do you realize how much God cares for you? As God says he cares for you, this is the God whose eyes are said to be even too pure to look at sin. Habakkuk chapter 3. And the just consequence for sin against the eternal God is to have to experience the eternal separation from God. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 25 that there's an eternal hell of fire waiting for sinners. But as Jesus described the horrors of hell, he was speaking of something that he would experience himself as the judgment of God descended upon him on the cross. And the God who couldn't even look at sin, he became our sin. And experienced in his eternal being what we should have to experience for all eternity. Friends, how do, how do we know God cares for us? God, God suffered for us. His mighty hands were pierced for us. Friends, when we feel anxious... There is peace to be found as we meditate upon the greatness of God. As we humble ourselves and refuse to think that our problems are bigger than God's power or beyond God's love. As we sing in one of our songs here, He who bore our blame can bear each care I need. So I lay it all on Jesus. Friends, this, this is what God's inviting us to. He's not telling us to be strong. He's not telling us to be more mentally tough. He's telling us to come to him. To cast our cares upon him. Because we can't handle them ourselves. They are a weight that we were not meant to bear. Our anxieties will keep us up at night. They will keep us bound and burdened. But not if we give them to Jesus. Not if we trust in his power. Not if we believe in his care. We come to God and we pray and we cast our cares on him. We say, God, this is beyond me. This is too much for me. I am not in control. But you are not limited like me. And you care deeply about me. So I give this to you. And I trust you for whatever you decide to do. Friends, how we, how we deal with anxiety is not by trying to take control, but by humbling ourselves and giving ourselves to the mighty hands of God that bear the scars of his love and trusting that he's in control and his way is going to be for the best. That's how we deal with anxiety from a spiritual standpoint. However, it's not only these internal battles that we face. There's also an external enemy that we have. Which is why Peter moves from talking about our anxieties to immediately then jumping in in verse 8 to talking about our adversary. So let's talk about point number two, defending against our adversary. In our 
Western mindset, we like to think that we are beyond the primitive and uncultured ways of believing in evil spirits, right? That was back in the old time when they used to, like, I don't know, pray to the rain gods, right? We don't believe that stuff anymore. But actually, in the South and the West, the idea of evil spirits is very present. And so I have to wonder, do we really want to be culturally elitist and think that we've learned things more than the rest of the world? Or maybe we have actually forgotten some things that the rest of the world knows are fundamentally true. The Bible is clear that the devil is real. And he is really against us. And so we're told in verse 8 to be watchful because he is prowling around like a lion looking to devour. We are told to be watchful, to be aware. In order to be watchful and aware, you need to be sober-minded. You need to be clear-headed. Like, I don't know about you, but if I knew there was a lion hunting me, that doesn't sound like a good time to smoke a joint or get drunk. God tells us to be sober. Not because he's trying to keep a good time from us, but because he knows there's an adversary who's hunting us. And we need to be watchful. We need to have all our senses about us. Now's not the time for dullness. Now's the time for alertness. Now, this passage does not specifically say about how the devil is trying to devour us. And I think that's actually on purpose because there isn't just one way. There are many ways that he's after us. Ephesians chapter 6 says he has many schemes. He isn't like the Sixers coach, Doc Rivers, who doesn't seem to know how to adjust the game plan. I'm sorry, I've been saving that shot for a while since the frustration of last year. God bless him, but man, man does not know how to adjust. If he can't get us one way, the devil's going to try to adjust. He's going to try to get us another way. The devil doesn't just have one way he tries to stop us. But he does have two goals of what he's after. We see his two goals, right? The dawn of humanity in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, Satan tempts the first humans, Adam and Eve, to sin, to disobey God. How's he come to do that? By telling lies about God. Is God really that good? Playing the seed of doubt in their hearts. God's holding out on something good from you. There's something better there. He sows a lie about God. And then when they choose to believe him and doubt God and and choose to sin and disobey God, what happens then? They go and they hide in shame. Because here's what Satan loves to do. He loves to tempt us to to sin. And then when we do sin, he likes to point out how bad we are as sinful people. Revelation chapter 12 says he is the accuser of the Christian. And so while the devil can often change tactics, he, he really doesn't change goals. He wants you to believe lies about God. And he wants to bring up accusations against yourself. That's what he's after. He's after lying to you about God and accusing you about you. He wants to, he wants to lie to you. I know God says this is wrong, but you got to do it. you got to do what feels right. you gotta, you got to be true to you. The Bible's so outdated anyways. You can't believe everything it says. You know, God doesn't really know what's best. Like, come on. He wants to lie to you. And then when you listen to him and sin, he wants to accuse you. What's wrong with you? You'll never change. See how bad you are? Oh, you can go in church and you can play the church thing on Sunday, but if people knew the real you, everyone would reject you. Lies about God. Accusations against us. Let me just pull back the curtain a little bit and illustrate this for you personally. Uh, I debate using personal illustration because I don't in any means want to elicit sympathy, uh, but I want to make sure you know that like, I'm not up here talking about something that's like theory. This is real life for me. <laughs> And maybe by me voicing my struggles, that will empower you to feel a freedom to to voice your struggles. Uh, So here's some recent tactics that Satan uses to get at me. Uh, He's trying to lie to me that God is not as powerful as I think he is. Um, Because every time, it seems like we've got one kind of situation handled in the church, something else just pops up. And so I feel him saying, like, you should just give up. Life was so much easier back when you were selling copiers, wasn't it? (laughs) Like, Like, why sacrifice so much God doesn't have your back? God's not really going to do anything. Get out now while you can. He speaks to me these lies about God and God's limited power. And then he brings up accusations against me. Man, you really failed that person. If they had a better pastor, they wouldn't have fallen into that sin. If Christ Church had a better pastor, people would be growing more, things would be happening more. You should be doing more. You should, you should know better by now. You know what happens when those things start to come into my mind? Anxiety is 
often not very far behind. I think there's a reason that Peter talks about her anxiety and then immediately talks about her adversary because the adversary's lies often lead to anxious thoughts. And I don't know, maybe I'm the only one up here who, who struggles sometimes and feels attacks, but I'm guessing I'm not. And so what do we do? What do we do? Well, how we resist our adversary is not by learning how to love ourselves and develop positive talk tracks about how great we are. No, Satan wins if he gets us to focus on us. Because that's actually what exactly he's trying to do. He's trying, he's trying to get our focus off God and onto ourselves. And so verse 9 tells us that how we resist the attacks of our adversary is by being firm, not in positive self-affirmation. We are to be firm in our faith. What is this faith that we are to be firm in? We says in verse 12 that he's been writing in this whole letter. He's been writing really trying to weave one theme through it. We have an identity as exiles, but underneath all that, there's this theme. It is, is the true grace of God. See that in verse 12? He says, this is, I've been writing to you about the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Again and again throughout this letter, we have seen Peter talking to us about grace. He opens this letter in verse 2 of chapter 1 by saying, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. In verse 10 of chapter 1, he says, we are saved by God's grace. In chapter 3, verse 7, he says, we are heirs of God's grace. In chapter 4, verse 10, he says, we are stewards of God's grace. Again and again, Peter's been holding out to us the grace of God. What is the grace of God? I love how J.I. Packer says it when he writes, the grace of God is love freely shown to guilty sinners, contrary to their merit, and in defiance to their demerit. God's grace is that he loves to love us, even though we do nothing to deserve that love. And in fact, not only do we nothing to deserve it, we've done, we do everything to demerit it. We do everything to make God not want to love us. We're not very lovable people, are we? Let's be honest. But God loves to love us because his love for us is not based upon us. We can't earn it, nor can we lose it. God's love for us is not based upon us. It comes to us by his grace, by his free choice to be this good, this kind, this great, and this merciful. God loves us by grace. And how we defend against the lies that Satan wants to tell us and the accusations he wants to bring us is by remaining firm in our faith in the grace of God. This, this firmness of faith is not speaking about the strength of our faith. It's speaking about the object of our faith. It's saying, do not waver. Do not think that there is salvation in something else or someone else. No, you stay firm that it is Jesus and his grace alone that you truly need. You see, for God's grace revealed to us in Jesus, that's what exposes Satan for the liar that he is. When Satan comes telling us lies to give up and thinking that God's not going to come through, God's grace tells us the truth. It tells us that I might not know what God is doing. I might not always understand why God allows certain things to happen. But I know the grace he has revealed in the love of Jesus who died for me. And so whatever Satan might have to say bad about him, God's grace revealed on the cross says, Satan, you're a liar. God really is good. I know he loves me. I know he wants what is best for me. He's the God who died for me. And for you, if you trust in Jesus. Whatever Satan wants to tell us about God, God's grace exposes his lie. And whatever Satan wants to tell us about ourselves, God's grace exposes that as a lie too. Because Satan, when he comes to these accusations, they're usually built on some version of the truth. Like, he's not going to accuse me of doing something that I haven't done. What, what, what hurts with his accusations is that they're often true, you know? Um, it's like, man, you know, you're not perfect. Yeah, that is true, isn't it? Like, it's hard to argue with that logic. But the point is, it's, it's still a lie, because while it's a part of the truth, 
part of the truth is not the whole truth. So part of the truth is a lie. Part of the truth is, yes, I'm not perfect. That is, that is true. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is that while I'm a sinner, I have a Savior who died to forgive me of my sin. And while I might struggle with sin, I have a Savior who empowers me to fight and choose God's way. I don't have to continue it in my sin. And while I might not always be who I should be, by the grace of God, I'm not who I once was. And so we defend against our adversary by remaining firm in our faith in God's grace. God's grace tells us who God is, and God's grace tells us who we are if we place our faith in Christ. Christian, whatever Satan wants to say against you today, here's what you need to understand. You don't need, you don't need more hugs and people telling you how great you are. Like when I'm sitting here sharing how I'm struggling, I don't need you to come up and direct me to how great I actually am and tell me all the wonderful things about how great pastor I am. That's not what I need. Oh, that might feel good for a little bit, I'm not going to lie. But that's not what I need. What I need is to remind myself that regardless of what anyone thinks of me, the God of the universe died for me. The righteousness of Christ covers me. And so whatever people do or don't think of me, whatever I am or I'm not able to accomplish in life, my life is not about what, who I am and what I do. My life is bound up in Christ and who he is. And nothing I can accomplish in life or nothing I can screw up with in life can change what Christ has done and the greatness and glory of his life. If you believe in Jesus, friend, you are covered by the grace of God. God sees you today, not just by yourself. He sees you through Jesus' goggles. He sees you through the lens of Christ. He sees you united with the life of his son. And let me tell you, there's nothing you can do or can't do that's greater than what Jesus has already done for you on the cross. And so when we remain firm on the grace of God, Satan's lies are exposed for what they are. Now, as Peter tells us to remain firm in our faith, you notice he then immediately jumps into something else. He says, remain firm in your faith. And then he says, remember or knowing that the same things are being suffered by your brothers around the world. He, he, he says, hey, remain firm in your faith and remember the brotherhood. Speaking about the Christians, speaking about the family of God, those who have placed their faith in Jesus, we're, we're family with one another. Why, why, why is he doing that? Well, he directs them outward to the world in verse 9. And if you notice, at the end of his closing letter in verse 12, he starts to name some specific people. And the reason he's naming most of these specific people, most commentators suggest, it's because these people were known to these people. <laughs> Right? Like, why bring up someone's name if these people didn't know him? So, most likely, these, these were people who had spent time with these different local churches. And so, he is directing them to think about the church global, think about the church around the world, and to think about the church local. Why is he doing that? Because one of the ways our faith stands firm in Jesus is by seeing how God's grace is sustaining other people whose faith is firm in Jesus. We need to see each other's faith. Not so that we marvel at one another and how great we are, but so that we can see God and how great he is. And if he has grace for them, guess what that means? He has grace for you. And so if God's grace can sustain the church in Afghanistan while the Taliban is actively seeking to hunt Christians down, and if God's grace can sustain the church in China where they have to meet in high and cannot publicly congregate without the government's permission and if God's grace can sustain you here in this church I know there are so many of you going through so many hard things you've lost loved ones some of you experience chronic illness some of you live with consistent pain some of you carry with you a persistent burden of struggle for your children some of you are fighting every day not to give into addiction Friends, as I see God's grace sustaining you, while I might have different struggles than you, your God is my God. And if he can get you through, that strengthens me to believe that I can get through. That's how this is meant to affect one another. Friends, the church is meant to be a living testimony that though Satan can seek to devour, he can be resisted because God has greater power. And should we doubt that, we just come here together and we look around and we see God's power at work in other people's lives. Not so we marvel at them, but so that we see how great their God is. And the good news is, God's the same for everybody. 
I think Martin Luther really nails it. When he speaks about how, and he's someone who knew a lot about spiritual warfare, he said one of the most important things in spiritual warfare is not to be alone. He he wrote this to one of his students. By all means, flee solitude. For the devil watches and lies in wait for you most of all when you are alone. Our, our culture loves to talk about the need for self-care and how we need to go be isolated. For that. You know, a lot of things come through isolation. Hey, go on this. Go away. Be away. Be away. Be away. Be away. Be away. Get this experience. Get that experience. Get that experience. Listen, friends. Hey, go to the shore. Enjoy some time away. No problem with that. Get some vitamin D. But, but, but some vitamin C. But, but, but here's what you need to understand. Persistent solitude is not self-care. It is spiritual danger. I'm going to put him on the spot, but Pastor Caleb, before he was a pastor, uh, a number of years ago, he had the chance for a promotion, a uh, really, really significant opportunity in his career, and he turned it down because it would take him away from being present consistently at church on Sundays. And his point was, well, <laughs> I don't care if it gets more money, I don't care if it's actually even this way better for my family, the best thing for my family is for me to stay spiritually strong. And to do that, I need to be in church. That was before he was a pastor. It's one of the things that got my attention. Hmm, maybe that guy might be a good pastor, he seems to love Jesus a lot. Um, Guys, this, by all means, flee solitude. We need one another to stand firm together so that we can together encourage each other to resist Satan's lies and we can together encourage one another to hold fast to our God of grace. It takes a community to stand firm in our faith in Jesus as we seek to defend against our adversary. Now, as we come to a close, both dealing with our anxieties and defending us and defending against our adversary, both of these are directing us to actions that we need to take. And we need to take these actions. But like a very good pastor, Peter does not close with just a bunch of commands. He actually closes not just by directing us to what we should do, but ultimately saying, here, you need to be directed to what God has done and what God is going to do. You see, it is the precious assurances of God's promises to us that really empower us to do what God calls us to do as we deal with our anxieties and we defend against our adversary. If we want to deal with our anxieties, if we want to defend against our adversary, ultimately, we need to depend upon God's assurance. This will be our quickest point, but friends, it is by no means the least important. It is by all means the most important. We need to depend upon God's assurance. Verse 10 tells us, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He was saying God's going to do a work. A work that one day will end all your suffering. Oh, you might suffer right now, but all suffering has an expiration date. All, All suffering is only, in light of eternity, all suffering is only for a little while. There is a day coming when God is going to put all things right. You see, this world where we can have an adversary, this world where we can struggle with anxieties, this is not the perfect world as God intended it to be. No, it's all moving forward to the ultimate world that God had designed in his heart for all eternity past. The ultimate world where we get to come together into the glory of Christ as we get to live in the redemption of the new heavens and the new earth where God will eliminate all struggles right at their source as he crushes Satan under his feet, as he destroys sin and its curse upon this world and he makes all things new in Jesus, never to be lost but always to be enjoyed forevermore. So listen, friends, you might be going through some stuff, and you might not see an end in sight, but God's told you the end of the story. The end of the story he's told you, the end of the story is going to be this, it's going to be restoration. The end of your story is going to be confirmation. The end of your story is going to be strengthening. The end of your story is you're going to be established. And friends, knowing the end is meant to give us a lot of peace in the present. When we know what God says he'll do, that should give us a lot of peace when we're struggling with the things we're going through. Because when God says something's going to happen, he's not just saying like his best ideas that he hopes will one day come true. These, These aren't wishful thinking for the future. No, did you notice what it says? I think it's so amazing. How do we know this is going to happen? Verse 10, who's going to do this? It says God himself, God himself 
personal pronoun. God himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. How, how do you know this is going to happen? God isn't delegating this stuff to someone else. And he certainly isn't leaving it up to us. No, the reason we're going to make it through is because God himself says he's going to get us through. God, the, the, the one with whom none compare, the almighty, holy, transcendent, exalted, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, king of the universe, he says, I'm going to bring you to the end, and the end of your story is going to be eternal glory in Christ. And nothing can stop what God says from coming true. And this is what verse 11 points us to. How do we know that God himself is a, is a himself that we can trust? How do we know that there's no power outside of his that can thwart his plan? Because, verse 11, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What it's saying is that God's kingdom, his purposes, his rule, his reign, will never be lost. And so as we come to a close, I want you to picture this for a moment. Peter is writing this. These very words, in the shadow of the greatest dominion, the greatest kingdom that the world has ever known, the Roman Empire, from roughly 600 B.C. to 400 A.D., the, the Roman Empire reigned. I mean, they were, they were the only show basically in town, ruling over most of the known world. And Peter is writing this smack dab in the middle of that dominion. <laughs> These Christians might have been doubted and might have been tempted to doubt that God's assurances would come true as they faced so much suffering in their lives at the hands of such a powerful empire. But the Roman Empire's dominion wasn't forever. The Colosseum, where so many Christians were brought to die in the gladiatorial games, it's now a building of rabble. You can go and visit it as a tourist, and I have, and it's neat to walk around that ancient piece of history. But guess what? It's an ancient piece of history. The reign of the Roman Empire is no more. But God reigns forevermore. And those who trusted in him back then are living in his eternal glory now. Their suffering was for a little while, but it is now over, and so too ours will be. Listen, God can act now and bring relief in a moment. Whether it's through medicine or miracle, he can heal sickness. He can repair relationships. He can provide finances. He can mend broken hearts. God can restore now. And sometimes he does. For some. And I don't always know why it's for some and not for everyone. But I do know there's a day coming where if you have a chronic illness that no doctor can cure, there's a day coming. When the great physician will touch your broken life and put you back together the way he always created you to be. You might have relationships that are lost on this side of eternity. But I know there's a day coming when God will bring you to himself. And the greatest relationship that you're always meant to have, you will enjoy forever as you live with your Lord face to face. Friends, he himself, whose dominion will never end, whose authority can never be challenged, whose purposes will always stand. He assures you that he will not let you be broken by what you're going through, but that one day your current suffering will be like the ruins of the Colosseum. They will be ancient history. And you'll be restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established in the eternal glory of Christ. And so, friends, there is meant to be strength for today as we think about that day. So as you go through this life of exile, deal with your anxieties by bringing them to God and trusting him to care for you with his all-powerful, all-loving, nail-scarred hands. Defend against your adversary by staying firm in your faith and trusting that his, God, God has grace for you as you enjoy his grace with his community, the church, and depend upon God's assurance that he himself will preserve you until the great day of living with Christ in eternal glory. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer.